Lewis Farrier was a bit of a character, a bit of an identity at Queenscliff. He came to be the last of the cooter fishermen there, the last of the old traditional cooter fishermen, also known as a barefoot fisherman because he never wore shoes. I interviewed him for the DVD about the cooter boats and the cooter fishing. And years later, he told me a tragic story that intrigued me. And I eventually went back to interview him about that story. But first of all, we need to set the scene. We need to backtrack a quite a few years. His father was a fisherman at Warrnambool originally, and at a young age, he was involved in a shipwreck, the wreck of a La Bella, and he saved several lives. That was in 1905. But first of all, Lewis will tell us about events leading up. But he walked along the beach to where his 14-foot black hulled um, clinker built uh, dinghy. You'd be aware of it. It wasn't a carvel built, it was a clinker built. <coughs> and he just um, grabbed hold of the grappling up on the beach and turned the dinghy around and pulled her out into the water a little bit. And away he went in a, uh, and he was kneeling down in the dinghy and um, he was sculling it with the uh, with, uh, left hand. And uh, as he's going around the uh, breakwater, he sees the lifeboat is ahead of him. And for every uh, foot, the lifeboat seemed to go ahead into the, there must have been a big sea on and the strong uh, southwest uh, gale of wind. And she was blowing back more than she was making headway and Dad passed him. And uh, Dad got about a hundred yards further out in the water and he saw a body on the water and he helped him aboard the dinghy and then he, Dad turned around and put, it abo put the chappie aboard the, um, the lifeboat and they'd already picked up one survivor. And then Dad again kept on going with his little dinghy and he was trying to get whatever Lee could with the... Um, she was a steel ship, the La Bella, a barkentine from... Um, a French barkentine, the La Bella, and... Um, Already the masts had already, uh, two masts had gone, the wheelhouse had gone and at one stage I think there was a, a winch on board and that was supposed to weigh over a tonne and the sea came and just threw it over as though it was a plastic bag. And Dad thought, oh this is no good, they were crying out, save us, save us and wreckage was coming. Some made it to the shore, some were drowned and um, there was um, <coughs> one man tied to the... Uh, to the mizzen and uh, Dad got, uh, got the dinghy and he put it right under the counter and with the surge of the sea all the time kept the dinghy up under, the, up under his counter, you know, didn't drift out of it, she would just seem to be wedged there and uh, Dad got aboard and struggled over the, the sloping deck of the La Bella and when he uh, got there he took out a pocket knife and he cut the uh, the ropes that was tying the man to the lifeboat and it happened to be the captain, Captain Myles. And um, he uh, was helped into the boat and uh, into the dinghy and there was another man and he was the first mate and he was holding on to some debris on the deck and Dad helped him and put him in the dinghy or helped lower him in the dinghy and even took off his flannel shirt and put it on because uh, they were freezing and it meant nothing to Dad temporarily. He only thought it was only going to take a couple of minutes or uh, ten minutes or something. And uh, he rode back and of course when he got to the uh, breakwater there was hundreds of local people and cheers went up and he was a hero from that moment and uh, he drifted out of the limelight and the other was um, what they call jour journalistic history how they saw it and how they didn't, but Dad repeatedly said he did nothing any more or less than any other man would have done. Lewis's father received bravery awards and a citation from the Prime Minister. Sadly, his fame engendered petty jealousies within the community, causing William to leave Warrnambool and join the Lighthouse Department. As a newly married man, his first posting was a Cape Shank Light and later the South Channel Pie Light in Port Phillip Bay. The light had living quarters for the keeper and his family. They alternated with another keeper, month about. Many years later, as a guest of Parks Victoria, Lewis was taken out to the light by helicopter. 
prior to it being dismantled. And they took me across and I can see now hanging on to the handles of the rail and climbing up and all I had was eyes full of water, full of tears. I couldn't believe that I'm walking where mum had walked and where dad had walked and where my brothers and sisters had walked. And when I went into this round uh, building, it wasn't, wasn't box-like, it was a round building. It would be about um, 30 feet wide and about um, 30 feet all the way round. And I was amused at sticking out from the face of the wall inside the, uh, the lighthouse were wooden shaped boxes where the children used to sleep in. There was a couple of nails built into it and uh, that's where it was. And um, there was uh, many uh, instances that uh, the most important place uh, in the lighthouse as far as mum was concerned, but dad considered the light was the most important. It had to be kept alight and polished and cleaned and everything. Lewis's parents read 17 children and it wasn't all smooth sailing. Uh, Dad said to Mummy, she said, what's wrong with you, uh, Francis? And she said, I'm not feeling well, but she says, I'm going blue. And uh, the baby was stillborn. And that happened three times in three years. And it was a, it was um a flannelette bag and Dad, uh, Mum took the, the, um, the fetus and put it in the bag with a handful of salt on it and tied a knot in it and just kept it somewhere on the lighthouse. And when the opportunity arose, and it happened on two other occasions, Mum had three fetuses of the children. This was obviously a very tragic event for Lewis's mother having three miscarriages on her own on the South Channel Pile Light. This was a story which had fired my interest years before. But was it really accurate? Did she really lose three on the South Channel Pile Light, as indicated? Or was it that she lost three over her lifetime? Either way, even one would have been a tragic event. And she went ashore and she buried them under a big pine tree at... Um Dramana, uh, Dramana Cemetery. Lewis's father spent some time painting ship murals on the interior walls of the lighthouse accommodation. Sailing ships were still pretty prevalent in 1900, in 1905 it was exactly, and um, he used to um, mix up a bit of paint of various colours and on the inside of the, uh, of the light, uh, he'd paint a, paint a ship, he'd paint a sailing ship, and they were beautiful. And um, uh, they came down and uh, said, we want to take them back to the museum at Polly Woodside and uh, put them up there. And we've never heard of it since, but we've tried to get them down here for Queen Street. And that's where I think they rightfully belong. The paintings are currently in the possession of the National Trust of Victoria. Dad uh, realised it was time that uh, he needed a ship. He was over there for uh, 17 years, I think it was, in the lighthouses, and things were tough, and things were um, uh, better to be back home in Queen Street, more settled. And that's what he did do, and um, whilst he was over here, uh, or thinking of coming over, he said, well, I'll have to get the net dinghy and whatever we can, put everything we own. He said, we're not turning our back. So the Ferrier family moved to Queenscliff and the Cooter boat Surprise, a boat which Mitch Lako had built just a couple of years before. She's the middle boat of this group, seen racing at San Remo in the 1930s. She was then known as the Doreen. The old house cow, which had been kept ashore at Rosebud, it had to come too. That must have been a sight. But um, he filled up uh, with uh, uh, a couple of beds and a bit of furniture, whatever they could. And uh, there was another smaller dinghy, and uh, that was uh, Millie the cow. 
Righto, the cow's coming, yeah, the cows are coming. So righto, then they tied the cow into the dinghy. The man was coming down the pier and he said, what in the hell are you doing with that cow in the dinghy? He says, we're waiting for someone like you to give us a horse's collar so as we can tie it around the neck of the cow and tie it around whatever was available in the dinghy to stop the cow from falling over or getting washed overboard. Now that cow did nothing, <laughs> nothing but move for an hour and a half. It made this, <laughs> and mum used to try and take off the bellowing of the cow. But everything, we landed straight up on the beach, ran up and unloaded everything. Yeah, that was a good, a good time that was, it was, but, but of course I wasn't born. So the old surprise that shifted the Ferrier family to Queenscliff in 1917 still sails with the Cooter boat fleet today. But anyway, back to Lewis's story. My mother read ten sons and seven daughters, Geoffrey, Lewis, Mansley, Nelson, Colin, Stevie, Frankie, Valley, Willie and Jackie, Alice, Olive, May, Jean, Joan, Patricia, Yvonne and May, and read us and I look in the local newspapers, one recently where a man was sitting on a veranda in, the, in one of the, in Geelong, and there was a little child with him and he was talking about how hard it is in these depression years. And I, of course, I look at the TV and I say, depression years, you've never been so well off. I said, um, my father had his first house built here at Queenstown with picking up big pieces of timber that was um, uh, Oregon wood that used to get washed off uh, going on a trip across to Tassie and they used to, fishermen all picked them all up and used all that timber and helped build a house and lay a floor but we had a house built a 25 pound a, a, a room and we had four rooms and we had no flooring. It was the flooring on the floor or the lining of the rooms. And mum and dad said we'd prefer the lining. And uh, things were, were really tough in those days. Uh, mum used to say, son, when you were born on the beach, she said there was um, the local fishermen that had a great haul of, um, of salmon, something like 200 boxes of salmon and they gave the life, uh, the wreck bell a couple of tingles and all the fishermen came down and they all, a lot of tourists because I was born on the first day of December, the 12th month, 1924. And mum said um, she was helping pulling on the, on the net and in a long, long way, other people pulled on the other side of the net to bring the fish in up onto the beach. Dad looked up and he saw Mum and he went up to Mum and he said, come on, Francis, in your condition, you shouldn't be here. Mum never said a word, she just dropped the line there and some eager tourist pull, picked it up and started to pull a fish net. And Mum was walking up and she said, um, she felt me fall from her stomach to her womb and she clasped her hand. And I can see it so real. Mum was standing there, oh. Lewis always said that he was born on the beach at Queenscliff. Some people are a bit sceptical about this. There's no doubt, with Mother hauling in the net, he probably made his start, the start of his way into the new world. But whether he was actually born on the sand, we don't know. But we could only take Lewis at his word. It was the beginning of the ferries making their mark in Queenscliff, because I was born. <laughs> One of Lewis's hobbies was catching sharks off the jetty at Queenscliff. He told me once that he used to bring a newspaper down to the wharf and a rifle. He'd throw the old newspaper into the water. The shark would come up to have a look at the paper and he'd drill it with the rifle. Don't know about that story. I think it might be one of Lewis's tall ones. Anyway, he helped keep the population of sharks in check. Most of the ports along the coast had lifeboats stationed 
for the rescue of the crew off shipwrecks. Portland, Port Ferry, Warrnambool, Navy, Port Campbell, Queenscliff, all had lifeboats. Initially the lifeboats were rowing boats with a bit of sail as you can see here. But in the early 1900s they were all motorised and the crews were made up largely of fishermen. Perhaps a few others. In Queenscliff the Ferrier family were well represented on the lifeboat. Lewis was bowman for 37 years. And I went to practically every rip that there, every wreck that was along the coast. I went all the way down below um, lawn there when a fisherman went out and unfortunately he never came back to this earth. But he'd, uh, he'd taken a rifle with himself and he obviously committed suicide because uh, I stepped aboard the boat and I said, uh, no, he's not here, but his gun is. And, and we thought, oh, he... I went to school with the boy and that, and uh, that was a bit of history. In 1949, the steamer Time stranded off Point Nepean due to loss of steering coming in through Port Phillip Heads. The first the locals knew of it was when... The wreck bell rang, because the lighthouse keeper uh, rang, rang, always rang um, uh, one of the Twaites as the engineers, Tom Twaites or his son Cliff, and they only lived a few houses from one another and right opposite where the wreck bell is. And uh, we went down there and saw her high and dry, and that's where she was and stayed there. So we went down alongside her and we took, um, we went down there and there wasn't much sea on, not much sea on at all, but we went alongside and we took uh, 23 of the crew and brought them and put them ashore on the Queenslip uh, main new pier and uh, they went to um, the Esplanade Hotel which was renowned in those days to take uh, uh, people in, um, in distress from boating accidents or near drowning and uh, we went back and uh, took uh, uh, the rest of the crew and took the captain and brought them back and she laid there for a couple of months and um, they auctioned her and a couple of local fishermen bought her for a miserable sum. A syndicate of fishermen bought the wreck from the insurers and did very well salvaging the cargo of sugar and timber and all sorts of other items, ships, boats, all sorts. They had an auction on the foreshore near the wreck bell. Lifeboat practice was held monthly. We used to have to um, uh, go down to the end of the pier and we'd um, run down with a stopwatch by the um, superintendent waiting outside the lifeboat shed and he'd clock us as we went in and how long it took the average or the crew to assemble her. There was only... Um, there was, uh, there was the superintendent, the government representative, and then there was the um, uh, chief engineer was Tom Twaites, the assistant engineer was Cliff Twaites, his son, and then there was um, a fisherman of experience and he was given the, uh, uh, the position on the boat as the coxswain in charge. And I can remember one time was Phil Shapter, another time was Hecky Todd over the years. There was Arnie Jurgens, there was Charlie Jurgens, and there were, yeah, Charlie Jurgens. And then my brother Stevie was uh, coxswain for a, while, for a couple of years. And uh, I was still appointed um, as the um, bowman. And it was my place that um, I'd, uh, lie, I'd um, pick out two crew members to go and pull the doors sliding back and pull them, pull them, pull them in the position because the lifeboat is going to go down through those doors and down the slip at about 35 mile an hour. And, um, and then uh, there was two other crew would have to come back to the stern and un do the uh, chain that was holding on to the, um, the holder of the keel and undo that and the lifeboat then was balanced and I would have to stand amidships and I would say to them, crew, not a motion, not a motion, stand where you are. And then I'd go to the bow and I'd pull, the, there was a hammer 
and I'd knock a block about that high and that square and I used to drag it out the way and she was tilting like that, the lifeboat. And when I would get aboard the lifeboat uh, and, there, and the coxswain would say, go forward, um, Bowman, and take two men with you. Righto, I'd go forward and I'd call two men and she'd tilt a little. I want another two crew, I'd name them by name because I went to school with them. And uh, when she went, bunk, she was going down that, uh, that uh, slipway at 35 mile an hour and uh, it was a wonderful sight to see it. We had the governor there one day and the Navy was there one day. It was an amazing thing, wonderful. And we got five shillings a month for the voluntary services or they gave us that and um, we'd go out to the rip and try her in the rip and sometimes uh, we'd be going in the coxman, uh, the um, superintendent said, how much further we're going? He said, oh, another mile or so. He said, no, he said, my stomach can't stand it, my nerves can't stand it. Take her back home. They'd get seasick. They didn't like the lifeboat going through the rip. And rocket practice was held monthly too. We'd uh, go down to the end of the pier and put the, um, the, the rocket up and and then stabilise it in amongst the planking on the pier. And then we'd have the box with uh, all the rope in it, all coiled up. And uh, we'd stand back and um, the uh, coxswain would uh, light the rocket. And those rockets were somewhere around about 1880 and they were called a Shamali rocket. And um, he always went for the oldest rocket and never in all the time that I can remember now, in 37 years did a rocket fail us. It always went. We had that practice and uh, we'd come back and uh, we'd line up and take our names and that, that was every Saturday of the, the first Saturday of the month and that was all. And then we um, had practice of, um, of um, firing from one pier to the other pier and half the crew would be on one side of the pier and the other pier and they'd pull the line tight with the rocket line and as, as the rocket fell down, down would come the rope that was attached to it. Well, we'd pull it in as tight as we could until they uh, put a breeches buoy and they got one of the crew to volunteer and hop into the, the breeches buoy in like a pair of pants that your legs had hang through and um, about that far uh, above the water and, and pull us across and that was um, for practising for survivors, you know, off a ship. But uh, we never had to go through that. Uh, we did when the Arungal went ashore at Bowen Head on November the 10th, 1940. Uh, we lowered a lot of the people over the... Um, the side on a ladder and uh, held on to them and they went aboard the boat one at a time until they got the passengers off and then we brought them ashore here at the pier and then we went back again and um, the ship was um, finally uh, aground never to go again and she's still out there off the Bowen Heads and um, that, that was the finish of it but uh, Rocket practice was very, very, we had to be efficient, very efficient at it. It was a good game, it was. Lewis lived to be 92. He gained some fame in his old age and he took to it like a fish to water. He was the go-to man at Queenscliff. If somebody come, some of the media come down and wanted a story, they'd be sent to see Lewis, the barefoot fisherman. One of his early claims to fame was ferrying the movie stars Gregory Peck and Arva Gardner backwards and forwards across to Portsea in his boat back in the 50s when they were making the movie On the Beach. He got them to sign the top of his rudder. Yes, there was a character was Lewis. We did lose a lot when we lost Lewis. By the way, the Queenscliff Maritime Museum has a wonderful collection of everything to do with the lifeboats, including the whole lifeboat that Lewis and the others would have volunteered on, and all the gear, fishing history, shipping history, Port Phillip Heads history, very, very worthwhile 
Regional Museum. Well worth a look.